liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, vom 7. März an, Uh, starting from the 7th of March, the German HG Museum, uh, which, on behalf of which I would like to welcome you here today, there will be an exhibition of the new Germany integration and diversity. Um, it is shown how there is a UTP, um, but it is not the title, it's, is a descri descriptive title and of a since 2010, Germany is an um, immigration country, so it is a fact that German society and politics have, igno have been ignoring this fact for a long time. The workers in the East and the West that were there for a only for a short term uh, were perceived as such. However, they came from different parts of the world of Germany, and people Germany perceived these workers as an unwelcome, as unwelcome immigrants. Therefore, the structures of in institutions in, that are there for uh, education, labor, health, and social participation created a country that is perceives itself as a homogeneous society and immigrants are forced into fringe groups. Yes, they exist, they live in Germany, um, they might, they are allegedly less educated and this is a racial assumption towards those people because in Loschwitz, for example, people from board will not get a, a flat there because the t landlords would not accept that. Or another example, uh, colleagues with Turkish sounding names um, are often asked how they would how they have achieved their new position in a job because people would not think that they would really achieve it. So we have to sensibilize our societies because there are some open and uncovered um, insults or hostility towards foreigners. So Germany has a normative uh, Uncovered racism variety is not shown in a country um, just like that, but society has to openly accept the variety and diversity, for example, a double nationality, the acceptance of different religions, religions, different schools, introduction of new holiday days and introductions of several official languages. But um, many people think that this is not a good thing, but this is a forced integration of um, different cultures. As a f philosopher says that there are deep cuts in a society that are not overcome uh, just by a dialogue, however, a different um, perception does not necessarily lead to uh, hostility. I, will, I hope that this conference will lead us uh, further on the right way and that we have fruitful discussions. I would like to thank the organization, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, the Anti-Discrimination Office, the Forum for Critical um, right-wing extremist research, and I hope you have a very fruitful conference and discussion. Thank you very much. I'm Herbert Mölfeld and I, I work for 
Uh, I'm Heike Fritsche. I work for the Anti-Discrimination Office in Saxony, and I would like to welcome all of you here to this conference uh, on institutional racism. This is the fifth event within a series of events concerning democracy questions that, that we have organized over the last years. In the recent years, we have focused on um, extremism and discussed it. We asked the questions, the uh, democracy, we discussed problems in Saxons democracy. We have um, talked with institutions and their doubtful role within democracy. This year, in, in late summer, we um, suggested this conference and we have received a lot of positive feedback and this is why we have now a lot of cooperation partners that support this project that I would like to mention once again. It is not only White Denken Institute, but it's also the Anti-Discrimination Office and the Flüchtlingsrat Sachsen and the Ausländerrat Dresden, the, the theater in Berlin, and the German Hygiene Museum. You can see this also in our program. Um, thank you very much to the Hygiene Museum that you made this organization uh, and event possible. I would like to introduce uh, the topic also in terms of organization, and I uh, hand over to Heike. Well, I would like also like to welcome you here to this conference. I would like to talk uh, on the name of all cooperation partners about the motives of this conference and about the aims and questions we would like to talk about today. As to the background of the conference, in recent years there were different e aspects of racism that are being discussed, for example, black facing scandals, just as we have seen at a, a second broadcasting program, a racist words in children's book, the debate on Saracen and integration policy questions and f flight and asylum. And when the NSU, the National Socialist Underground, was revealed and discovered, people have were asking for responsibility. Because racism is just more than an individual prejudice, but is their responsible structures, just like the Federal Office for the Protection of Constitution or the police, that have responsibility there. And it is very difficult to talk about these incidents uh, with the term of racism. And this especially applies to Saxony because there are several problems that are not being described as racism. For example, uh, certain behavior structures or processes are not called racism. And if people call those processes racism, they say, oh, no, that's not racism. Uh, I'm not it's everything but that. This is why I'm really happy to see so, so many people of you here today and that we have the opportunity to discuss this question. We would like to analyze um, examples and example feels what are aspects of institutional racism uh, questions or for example how is can institutions reproduce racist exclusion and how are they administered how can it be that a rigid pattern of behaviors and structures, institutions uh, with a traditional background can anchor the racism in the society and how we can break them up. What do we have to do in order to 
disclose those um, practices and how can we get rid of them? What are the uh, what is the role of every individual in this framework? How can how much range of action have the single persons and so what are options in this case and this is, will also be a part of the workshop. Um, you have seen the program uh, choosing those workshops was very difficult because people, it is to be said that in all relevant fields of participation uh, is race, uh, there is racism we elect, we choose those topics according to the experiences in Saxony, what are the most important problems in Saxony, and we, and in most workshops, we also add the federal perspective on the um, topic. Workshop one, I would like to, I would like to present it. It is done by Iris Fischerbach and Daniel Batte of the Anti-Discrimination Bureau. It is about racist interest policies and ever since 2011 we've started almost a campaign uh, against racist interest policies in Leipzig with claims and with several stakeholders that are still ongoing and uh, we would like to establish a overview what we have we done, what are the obstacles and how can we tackle these problems in Leipzig. Okay, the workshop number one is being done in the seminar room number one. You can go in there even if the title says you cannot go in there. The second part is um, racist in, with the example in Mugan. It is the case of Mugan, an example of the origin of racist right wing hegemonies. It is done by, it is presented by Friedemann Afforderbach, Solveig Höppner, and Dr. Britta Schellenberg. The, it goes back to racist assault in Mugan in 2007. And Dr. Britta Schellenberg has written about it and has analyzed the work of the investigation authorities. She has analyzed whether racist stereotypes have been transferred from the investigation of process into the society in the public debate and are therefore dominant there. We will talk about this in the workshop and we will discuss this together with you. We planned um, as the Weizetting institution to use the material of Dr. Schellenberg um, for another publication meaning not only in form of a dissertation but it will be published as a book at the beginning of March. This will, workshop will be held in the room number one. This third workshop will be about work and education and will be held in room number three from Rudaba Badakshi, Svetlana Kreismann and Andreas Hieronymus. And workshop four is uh, on racial profiling will be held here in this room because we have received many um, applications or acceptances. It will be a very interesting topic because there was a campaign for the victims um, of police investigation. There is a fifth program workshop. We will talk about um, racism in literature, meaning black um, German literature in history and racist literature uh, at universities and Adetun Kubas Adebisi and Natasha Kelly have um, <laughs> said that they will present and lead this conference. Thank you very much for this. We thought it was very important that we have an, an additional offer. 
edition of the workshop. Of course, there were many more topics, racism, structure and institutional racism in health services uh, when uh, renting flats in asylum system and many more. Of course, this will not be possible to speak about it just in in one day, but after the conference we will publish our results and then we will also include questions that we will not be able to discuss here at today. So if any one of you has a suggestion for any contributions, please feel free to come to say this. The book will be published in September. Now I would like to talk about organizational issues. We've already seen the reason for the fifth workshop is the high number of attendants and we are close to our limits. About 100 people are here today and 190 people are here. There might be some problems and some um, problems also in the workshop. We didn't want to uh, send people away and hope you understand uh, that there might be some minor problems. I hope that this will function very well. We did not start um, punctually. This is why some workshops will start later because we do not want to um, shorten the time of the workshops. I would like to ask every single one of you whether uh, you would like to go, prefer to go to another workshop if one workshop is too full. We have planned to make the in exhibition here in the room inclusion and exclusion um, because to make just an, another impetus. However, we had to decide it to to stop this exhibition and we're very sorry but it is an exhibition of photos and um, texts that show the perspectives um, of asylum seekers that are waiting for their residence permit. It is a temporary exhibition and we hope to include this exhibition also in the book that will be published where we're very sorry that we were not able to sh show this exhibition here. Concerning catering and food, we have decided on a model that includes that we are supporting the co costs. However, we would like to ask every single one of you to buy the drinks and foods for rather um, economical price. They're vegetarian soup, there will be a vegetarian soup as well. We will translate this conference here uh, for all of those who might need English and would rather he listen to the conference in English. If there is a need for a translation in the workshop, we will do not do this simultaneously, but only um, by a whispering. If people need a a confirmation of attendance, you can ask us right after the conference. We will record the conference for documentary reasons. The audience will not be recorded and Mr. Rosta will be our photographer. Daniello will also do this. If somebody has a problem with um, that, you feel free to talk to him openly. I would like to invite you to ask everybody with the green sign, we are members of the team, if there is a problem. I think that was all concerning organization and I think we can pass on to the first block that will be presented of Great Hannaford of the Cultural Office in Saxony and um, I hope you have an interesting conference. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Grit Hannebog. I'm the director of the Cultural Office of Saxony. We're one of the cooperation partners here at the conference. I'm very happy that the topic of institutional racism uh, finds so much interest. 
I will moderate the first block explaining what is institutional racism. There are two speakers, this Manuela Ritz and Mark Takesides. Welcome. I would like to introduce you to the two speakers. Manuela Ritz is a qualified social education worker. She has worked as a freelance anti-racism trainer for more than 10 years. She's also an author and actress in theater. And what is maybe interesting in the context of today's topic is she, is, she was born in Mögeln was raised there but left the town in 1989 and she wrote about her experiences of growing up in Mugeln in her biography The Color of My Skin and uh, there's one chapter dedicated to, the, to her personal racist experiences and she's also put this in a theatre play uh, that roughly translates into homicides are to be expected and this will most likely also be performed in Dresden this spring. Mark Terkesides is also an author. He is a migration and racism researcher. He has a doctorate. He holds a doctorate in psychology. And in his book, Banality of Racism, he investigated in the racist positions of German, he sees racism as not just a prejudice but part of a complete societal system. And he will explain this into great, in greater detail in his talk because racism is not only institutional racism but has to do with each and every one of us, all the people. So this is not a classical introduction with two presentations, but we'll start with an interactive part, including the audience. And I'd like to hand over here to Manuela Ritz. I'm very happy to be here and especially happy that so many people came, all the organizers are here. Sometimes I'm asked to, to help with conferences or contribute something practical. And my work is always practical, hardly ever theoretical, because racist attacks are not racist. And whatever you call racism, it, always, it can always happen in a structural, systematic way, because people don't interfere, they just stay and watch. And this is why I would like to do workshops with millions of people, and see if it works today. It has worked before and I think it's going to work here in this room. It also has the positive effect that those people who give the workshops in the afternoon can skip the part that I am doing now. And I'd like to start the way workshops tend to start with a round of presenting yourself, but but um, I don't want people to say, I'm Malu and I come from Berlin and I have two children and I work as such and such and we'd still be here by midnight and people would fall asleep. So I'd like to try something else. Maybe you've heard of murmuring rounds or murmuring sessions and I'd like to invite you to one of these right now. This is about turning to your neighbor. Pre presentations are about 
telling your neighbor something about what do you expect from a conference like this? What would you like to share with your neighbor? You can also introduce yourself. The, it's, it's a bit like a speed dating because you don't have that much time. So don't go on about your CV forever. Just share briefly what's important for you, what could be important for the person sitting next to you. Maybe like five to six minutes speed dating. I'm sure you can cope with this, be as murmur as loud as you want to and then we'll take the next step. Did you get that? Okay, then enjoy the murmuring. I love it. And I always ask myself in moments like this, why uh, why do adults always get so upset when children get noisy? And I love it when 190 people start talking. The next step would be to ask those people who are part of the majority society, which of you which of those who are white and German said in the presentation, I'm white and German, I'm somebody without a migration background, or I'm a member of the majority society? Who said that? Can you raise your hands? One, two, three. And you talk to each other? Okay. Three. So, nobody else then. So, I'll come back to you later. Everybody else who is German and white, why didn't you mention it? Uh, the microphone's here. Get a mic and just say what you think, why you didn't say it. Why didn't it occur to you to say it? What, what would you think was your reason to not mention it? Of course, the difficulties that I'm, I'm the icebreaker will German history. Well, what is, what is German and what is not German? That's the problem. So, in order to develop a, a, a natural um, self um, self perception, for example, Fr French people have that, Polish ha people have that, Danish people have that. Of course, there are uh, Italians, the Holy Roman uh, Empire, for example, or so we are all one family, and we have to understand that at first, and then we have to. Uh, take it as a starting point. German is one of many other uh, aspects. That was Are there any other reasons why you didn't mention it while introducing yourself? Well, it's not about whether I'm German or not. It is about racism in in our society. It doesn't matter who I, uh, what I am. I'm a human being. No matter what I look like, what I think, what is my ideology or political connections I have, I'm a human being, and that's the problem. So I come back to the three of you who figured it out and seem to find it important that they're German? Well, I say it or explain why I am here, why I'm so interested in the topic and I, 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 I said that I'm here from the white perspective and I'm very interested in the perspective of the affected well, my context is that I work in the scientific area and I have realized when 
sending my applications or doing applying for a job that there are several processes that show that if somebody is applying for a postdoc job and hands in its application and does not as to 100% fit into the expectations of a scientist or in the scheme the people um, expect and if they have a different origin or do not have um, the right relation to the science or as the person or as the country he comes from, well, then people tend to see North American and Western looking people um, as better and this is being reproduced and this is why I'm here. Okay, um, similar to what has said, said before, had been said before, uh, I wanted to know whether uh, people can define such processes institutionally as racism. As a reaction to I'm a human being in the first place. Well, people tend to perceive me as white or not white, and I would like to answer out of a white point of view. Often when people read my name that is Turkish, then people ask me where I come from, and if somebody with a German name uh, is asked, they, they never have to answer that question, and people with a German name or never ask where he, he or she comes from and uh, this is this is what this is my topic it was just the perfect link and I find it very interesting that we have many people here in the room who are not only white and German, but also something else. So the next question is, which, who of you said, I am a person with migration background, I'm a POC, person of color, anything like that? Who of you mentioned? Um, I just... Um, have talked about her with a, an experience where I have um, where an event where I have experienced racism. Do you think that was relevant? Okay, done. Anybody else who mentioned this? Well, I didn't mention that I'm black because people see that. <laughs> But I have given a reason why I am here at the conference. I, I feel affected and I have friends and students that are affected as well. So um, everybody sees that I am black, but maybe there is someone who doesn't see it. Anybody else? Anybody who wanted to say it? Okay. I have uh, heard from systematic discrimination in Saxony by the university law that discriminates the students that do not come from Germany that have to pay a high fee of about 800 euros and they are forced to pay that and I think this is really a hilarious discrimination I would like to 
go on explaining to you why is this important for today's workshop. So the background was the, what matters when we talk about racism and I think it's that structural and systemic racism, these categories are important in a scientific context, but I also think that racism is always about who are the bad guys and who are the good guys, and of course everybody here in the room will think we are the good guys because we are against racism. Um, but it, this is a complex topic because the disasters that we see in a context of racism are man-made. They're also undermined by people and can be broken up. The, and to be able to break up this structure requires to locate yourself first in these structures and realize what's your perspective. Institutions are not like natural disasters because institutions are equipped with certain instructions and rules and these rules are implemented and in the end of the day this is a personal matter because when I can't get a contract for an apartment or if, if I can't enter my daughter in the school I want her to attend, that is everyday racism. So. I think it's important to see what are your personal experiences, what, where have you been hurt, what, where are the deficits in your knowledge, well, what don't you know about racism, and I would wish for you to understand that you are part of these structures and in so far also part of the racist system and to, to be able to monitor this and see this because this is where it starts. It's important what you think. You have to know what you think when you fight, when, when you want to fight racism because your thinking will define your actions. So I think it would be a good approach to first think about whether you yourself are part of the problem or do you, do you want to be part of the solution? And this can only start with positioning yourself in the whole context. So you're now free and done. And I would like to hand over to Mark. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Mark. I have a migration background and I only knows, have known this for several years, but when Manuela was asked where she's done something practical, I am always asked whether I do something theoretical and yes, I do that. Uh, this is why I will try to uh, make it m more complicated, I think it has to do with racism because people tend to do it more uh, to simplify it because racism is a field that is not very well defined and is, is an equal e inequality so it's just like in sexism however there is no um, authority that says well uh, now we do racism because it divides the society and we really do want that but Quite in the country, racism is something, as Jostmann said, is a phantom. Racism, if it is, if it appears structurally, then racism is only a byproduct. Because people say, I'm not a racist, but people know that racist knowledge is being spread and people say, I'm not a racist, but on behalf of the human rights, we have to prevent that the Turks are hurting the women with similar stereotypes 
that are established. So you always talk on behalf of something else, and it's an institutional complex that exists in a very specific way. I will talk about that later in order, because it is a system in which the racism is um, in, in intertwined because nobody in this society says I'm a racist. Nobody does that. That is not allowed in a democracy and this is why we have a relation to to racism in, because racism is a phantom on behalf of something else. And racism in Germany is quite another topic than in another country that is certainly due to the history because if Racism is appearing in the society because this really disrupts the own individual perception because of the Third Reich, because of the history, because people always try to find another term for it, uh, hostility towards foreigners or xenophobia in order to avoid this, this word. But um, hostility toward foreigners foreignness is not uh, what it is about because this implies that there are Germans or nationals and foreigners and that there are two clearly divided groups and one has a advantage over the other and this model is not true because it's not about uh, that there is a divide in the society or there are two different types of population that live in one territory and there are um, rather uh, hostile towards the other, but it is about how this divide is created within a society, within a population. So how are foreigners created in a society and how are foreigners and um, strangers are becoming um, foreigners and strangers? So how is this topic created? It is uh, rather delimited, that product, but also from the so-called friends of the foreigners. So in Germany there is the tradition of a moral anti-racism. For example, Gunter Wallraff. He's Maybe you've seen it. He has um, ma made a film that's black on white and he has painted himself black in order to create a situation in which he is confronted with with racism and uh, this had the highlight in this film was that he was standing in front of a club and he uh, has more than six, he's six more than six years old and he's painted in black and he looks like a freak and he's got a plastic bag in the hand he just cannot enter the club and this is called discrimination and people think oh, what are you all going on about and people f ask themselves where do you ha where why does he do these things and how can he think he can res represent the blacks in Germany while I ignoring the whole d debate on racism and this more anti-racism is proving that racism and this is clearly shown in the situation of the film, is a problem of all the people of the working class and of the East Germans. We, in the opposite, Gunter Ralf, the friends of the Forense and the middle class of Germany, do not have a problem. It's the others that are barely in the higher than the foreigners and this is what is generated but this modest anti-racism anti is something that was introduced it's an introduced debate in Germany and this hinders us to talk about racism in a very broad way it is narrowed and the second problem is ignoring the problem of racism we have seen this um, in the Saracen debate and uh, in the NSU scandal. Thilo Saracen, uh, I think this is, uh, the best interview with Thilo Saracen was with the Zeit magazine and the question was, well, you are not a racist, but, you know, we know you're not a racist, but, well, I think, well, 
uh, shortly before that, he said that the Turks would <laughs> conquer Germany like the, Kos like the people in Kosovo, and it would n not matter whether it was were used German Jews because there would be more intelligent than the average society. What do you have to say in Germany in order to be a racist? I, uh, I'm really astonished to say that you are not racist because that is racism. And let's say together, Tito Saracen is racist. And I think you can say this because he has proven himself to be a racist. And you can see how far this ignorance uh, goes in order to prevent um, that people that are in the middle of the middle of the session are being determined a racist. And this debate has shown uh, that, and I think it was an opening up because he was being fought. Um, Tito Sara never before he was one of his, uh, a person in his position was dismissed Merkel has said something about it, but it was a very open debate, and for, for the first time you could say that uh, there is racism in the middle class, and uh, this has been proven. So there are many people that, um, and this is why this book was published, the NSU scandal is another example. Uh, I don't know whether people have read the report on the scandal. It is a very long chain of, of proofs because within the police there are several structures of perception that show who is a perpetrator and who is not a perpetrator. And the investigations um, were only led to one-sided investigation was made only mm, towards the direction that the perpetrator would be a, a foreigner but I do not have do not have to repeat that I've met people um, police officers in Munich and they said well we haven't done anything wrong and you have to ask well, how can how is that possible how can I say they didn't do anything wrong of course they did pursue an investigation but only uh, towards one side because there are routines that say if there are uh, homicides if uh, foreigners homicide that this is uh, rooted in foreigners policy and not part of right-wing extremism and this is part of institutional racism and uh, one should not be afraid to call it institutional racism. In the 90s there was a murder, the murder of Stephen Lawrence in Great Britain. Back then the police did not investigate this murder because uh, they did not hear um, testimonies, they did not talk to the family and nobody was was really detained for it and arrested. So this is why people called for a report and the police said we did not do anything wrong. And the former minister, Jack Straw, has asked the Lord McPherson to write a report on the case. And Lord McPherson uh, came to the conclusion that within the British police there is institutional racism and that was a landmark because there are no s individual police officers that are bad but it is about what is the knowledge that is and what are the perceptions of the police uh, British police concerning who are perpetrators and what can be drawn from that? So these are the routines that people understand of institutional racism. And this depends on the perception, the point of view you, you assume. And Manuela has shown that quite well. So what is your perspective? All investigations that are led, uh, all studies that are being done in Germany re regarding uh, hostility towards foreigners show that the people, people, the society have prejudices and the majority has those prejudices. So what 
It doesn't make sense to call it prejudice because a prejudice is something very individual and then scientists come and um, but no, that's wrong, what you think is wrong, but I know what is right. No, it's these prejudices are collective uh, knowledge. So people have to presu- know that within the society there's racial knowledge, knowledge and that is also part of the structures and this is how we can counter these structures, this institution racism. People said, well, for example, teachers are the good ones and psychologists just like me are always the good and social workers are the good ones. So people, those people would never say that they have racist knowledge and they say, never, I, me, never. And this is the moment when people have to accept that this racial knowledge exists and that we have to counter these this knowledge but because it's not that bad that you have to you know that because when people do not really know a topic they just talk about whatever they think is just nonsense because this nonsense is uh, accumulation of things I've heard her say things the media says it is not about whether you've got a knowledge but whether you process it and it is about whether this knowledge is processed also institutionally this means that are the failures of in in our history because within the police there has to be such knowledge and it would not be immoral to talk about it uh, and if you have done these areas just like in the NSU you have to talk about it now this racist knowledge is of course not to be seen isolated it is always part of the apparatus of the system of the society and see meaning that the type of racism is settled embedded into the system for example on the labor market I've I've been raised with it that in Germany there are jobs for foreigners that are low laborers, manual work that for which you do not need a qualification. And of course people in the 60s had to come to Germany uh, for several reasons. They did not come to Germany to become engineers but to really uh, fulfill, to do these jobs. And this is called a this is a structure in which people are immigrating into Germany to do these jobs and then if you look at that, that you will see that um, among people with a migration problem they have a different a different structure within this within the society and this is a fun phenomena of these classes meaning people have immigrated and this is why there was a statistical discrimination that has said that foreigners were very were qualified enough to do those jobs but and this means this wasn't a free election so if you uh, choose to do such an unqualified job then you are not qualified enough to do the other job Thomas Mendelssohn once said that is very uh, funny with the Jews because their their hands are tied and then people say why do you don't you use your hands and this is another type of discrimination I mean this is another thing than the relation between two reason Emmanuel Wellerschein once said that racism has emerged together with the modernity and it the difference is that there are two different grooms and there is a concept that is called exclusion through integration meaning one group is being included into a session but ha- is being excluded during that process through violence and this is a very a example for how racism is 
being developed is when Christopher Columbus is conquering the new world. There's an interesting comment in the Columbus、um, diary, a logbook, and they see new islands and the nature, and also humans, people. And he just wrote, and then we've seen people. And you think, well, he's.、Um, He's sailing over the ocean, and then you do not, you are not happy about seeing those people. But、um, this is how the people are treating those others. Then, what did the Spaniards do? They unrolled their flag, and the well, let's say Aborigines、uh, heard、uh, how the Spaniards took over the land, and this. Lawful action of saying that the, the country belonged to the Spaniards was legal, and because nobody said this, no, it's not true, it was lawful. So this is a process in which the others cannot be included. Well, this is a, an, an example for how people are being conquered and being integrated without having a say in it. And this also shows why people were allowed to take over the country because it's the natural characteristics of the others that make them slaves. That's a natural characteristic、um, that、um, allow us to, or the, another group, to colonize them or make them foreigners. And this is a process of creating knowledge. And this is just like books, like. Science itself, it is was part of the scientific、um, racial knowledge. It was a scientific discourse, and it still generates knowledge. It explains it, but also it legitimizes it. It's always a discourse. So, if you read the book of Tilo Saracen, today we have a different situation. There are, of course, no not only poor foreigners, but also、uh, ones that are not poor, but For Sarans, there are still foreigners that、um, are working in the waste management or do unqualified job. Of course, this still is the case. But now you always ha- also have foreign doctors and engineers. So now there is also kind of a competition in the discourse, and it is re. Being reproduced by explaining it one again, so explaining it and legitimizing it is part of racial knowledge. So now the question is, how does it work? I would like to make it very, very complex and difficult. It's very difficult to do it in thirty minutes, but I would like to talk about how this works. This was part of a study that was called the banality of racism to underpin Hannah Arendt's banality of evil. Hannah Arendt, together with Eichmann, in court at this moment where she wrote, "Eichmann is not the ultimate evil; he, he is banal." Because Eichmann functioned in certain structures, he did his work, and that's what he keeps saying. He is really just somebody small who, and this is really about seeing the bigger picture. And part of the mechanism of denial in Germany was that extremism is. Racism is always talked about in the context of right-wing extremism, but this is not what it's all about. It's about the everyday small incidents and experiences, and we have to include this into our knowledge about racism. And apart from that, people who are affected to racism always ex. Experience that people tell them, "Oh, you're overly sensitive. You're neurotic." It wasn't discrimination. It's you who has the problem. In the end, a psychological problem. And this idea of being oversensitive is something that makes talking about racism 
very difficult in Germany. Every time you try to talk about something, you find yourself in the position that what you experience is, is belittled. If you have an experience like it's also seen in feminism, um, and people disqualify me as oversensitive, then maybe I will not talk about it next time, or I'll make very, very sure that I'm angry enough to still talk about it. So it's really difficult to talk about it. And, and I would speak in favor of oversensitivity. It's something positive because it's what makes it possible for us to experience and explore the topic. Racism is not just out there in the world. We have to find out about it. If, if I use a term like prejudice, then I imply that it is possible to have to make a con correct, accurate judgment. And this is wrong. There is no accurate judgment about, for instance, Turks. It's something always that has been reproduced all the time. So we have to talk about creation of racist knowledge. And we have to talk about normative ideas about equality. I need an idea, basic idea of equality to be able to talk about racism. But even if I know about equality, it's possible that I'm still blind to certain differences. So it becomes more and more complicated. And I think you really have to take a kind of a biased perspective. Otherwise, you can't see racism, not even from a scientific perspective. So being biased means I have to understand what the people affected experience. And usually, it goes this way in Germany. If something happened, if there was really a major incident, then we had research. But after a few years, it's ignored again. It isn't interesting anymore. And when it was about talk about hostility towards foreigners, xenophobia, it was always the native population that was asked about their prejudices, but what is really much more interesting would be to ask the people affected about their racist knowledge. What do they know from their standpoint? Can I understand how systems of power work? Can I defer that? And I'd like to explain to you some of the mechanisms for. I've identified four and have given them newly invented names, neologisms. The first is alienation. This is about that most people affected by racism have a pivotal moment in their life where their perception of themselves was not in harmony with the external perception. And these can be very small events, like little Mehmed was invited to the mayor's reception in Bielefeld to be awarded his prize for stay safe in competition. And Mehmed was out where do you come from, and we all know that you always expect the answer from somewhere else, but Mehmed names the na gives the name of a little village near Bielefeld, and everybody, the whole audience, starts laughing because they think the accurate answer would have been, I'm from Turkey. But what happens to this child at this moment is something really dramatic because this child thinks, I'm from such and such village, and everybody laughs because they think that's not possible, can't be true. You must come from somewhere else. And that is this moment where the own perception of where you belong is put into question. And people who grew up in Germany have not been born as foreigners. They themselves perceive themselves as as 
belonging as part of the population. And it's these pivotal moments that destroy these self-perceptions. It can be a very small incident, but it can also be with a person from Ghana that on the first day at school, children follow him on the first day and try to touch his skin. And this is, of course, much more dramatic. And these are moments that keep repeating themselves. And they're serial events. And in former times, it worked the way that you didn't automatically have the German citizenship. So when you turned 16, you had to apply for your own residence permit and you had to follow up a really humiliating procedure and you had to prove that you had to the right to stay here. So imagine you grew up here but there's this moment where you have a right to live here and this has a huge impact and you can probably imagine. So alienation is the first concept. The second one is something I call Verweisung, which is something like referral in English. Many people with a migration background, including Hertha Müller, who got the Nobel Prize for Literature, are angry about the constant questions about where they come from. So it's really, there's something, just a little bit about you that is foreign, maybe just your name, and you're asked where you come from. This is not just curiosity. It is. It has certain expectations behind it. People expect you come from a different place. So then if you say, I'm from Berlin, then people say, yeah, okay, but where are you really from? So people go on and on about it to find this other place. And then maybe uh, people say, oh, yeah, you're from Greece, and maybe you know this little place where I once went on a holiday. But of course, I don't know it. And then. What is also everyday practice, uh, a Turkish father taught me that his children come back more Turkish from school than they left in the morning, which, and this is because they're always asked about Turkey, and it happened to me. I was always asked about Greece, what's the climate back in Greece, back home, and, and, and I just thought by myself, I haven't been in Greece so often. And then I had this teacher who thought I should become a specialist on Greek anti antiques, antiquity. But, I mean, I can laugh about it today, but this is still happening today. And it's the same when teachers say, Aisha, come here, come to the front, explain to the other students what is Islam. And then maybe Aisha is from a family that isn't even religious. Or maybe it's something very natural to her and, and, and she doesn't really have the knowledge she could share. So this referral can have very different forms up to insults, you dirty Russian, go back where you come from. So it can come in all degrees from the smallest incidents up to direct insults in, in the institutional context starting from the moment where the OECD finds that persons with a Turkish origin surprisingly have a lower probability to be invited for um, job interviews. And this is, is described as a power effect on these persons. The third area is what I call de-equalization. This is about people being degraded and are excluded from equality. And then that makes the person who de-equalizes and degrades the other person the judge. So sometimes people will hear, oh, you, you speak uh, German very well. But somebody will tell them that who has a much lower educational background. You, uh, you might, uh, a taxi driver 
might tell an academic, oh, your German is excellent, which means that other person becomes or makes himself a judge and tells the other person what is German. Or another favorite of mine is, oh, you're well integrated. That's another example. There are people who can go on and on about how terrible f foreigners are and that in Kreuzberg in Berlin you can't you can't even set foot on the road and immediately you're attacked, assaulted. And then the the other person might say, Oh well I have a migration background too but then of course the reaction is yeah well that's you and you're the exception. I didn't mean you. So saying you are well integrated is the moment where the standards are set and where the imbalance is created and the person who says this is the judge who sets the standards and this is an absolutely incredible situation because it's not easy to answer to this. So the third area of the third mechanism before I come to my conclusion is taking away resp responsibility from people. To give you an example, this is from a kindergarten and there was a child with from an Arabic fam family and immediately staff in the kindergarten say, oh, this is its southern temperament and of course the, the it must be its southern temperament. This is comes completely natural. These descriptions come up in a split second. And the moment I enter this southern temperament, I don't see the individual child anymore. This is what what is in the foreground, nothing else matters and all other personal traits can be explained by this and, and maybe sometime later it's found out that the child was just bored because it was very intelligent and, and this is why he bit because he wasn't satisfied so we are so fast with ascriptions what a Turkish or Arab origin causes what kind of character traits we don't see the rest and of course then we take away people's responsibility for them safe because they're not responsible for what they do it's their Arab origin why they're doing it this is why I call it de-responsibilization or something. So this is just a short overview about the topic. But what is clear that in a society, Franz Vernon once said, either a society is racist or it isn't. Racism isn't something that just happens. Somebody is not murdered just because of racist motives, but our everyday life is not affected by it. It's, it's, racism isn't something that happens as an isolated event, but it happens in the context of uh, structural racism, of a racist society. So investigating racism is not about finding out who's good or bad, but it's finding out a it's about acknowledging that everybody in a society is more or less involved in racist practices. And of course, a person with Turkish origins can also marginalize or exclude Roma, Sinti people. And so that would make up a, a whole new area. And we don't want to just see the victims as the good people all the time. Even an and really please keep this in your mind because moral racism, victims are always seen as the good ones, but if they start 
being bad, be, uh, beat up people in the underground trains or something, then suddenly all the moral anti-racism turns completely around against the perpetrators that were victims before. So it's a very complicated construction and mostly we need political answers to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Gitz and Mr. Takesidis, for your very committed um, speech and giving us this practical and theoretical information. Uh, we, I think we've got 20 minutes. I think we have about 20 minutes to ask questions and make some comments. I would like to ask you to use the microphones. Yes, they are on. It would be very nice if you would um, give us your name and where you come from. I would ask, ask you to make only a short comment. Thank you very much. I would like to speak about institutional racism in the middle of society. I think it's planned by societal and also political elites and I think that our society divides people into poor and rich in people with jobs and the unemployed and a society like this needs racism of the middle. Its function is to offer scapegoats so that people can pass on their frustrations further downwards so they don't attack the elite. And it's also a way of defuscating the causes for poverty. And people are stopped from realizing this. Mr. Westerville, as foreign minister, said that people on social benefits were like in the Roman decadence, they're lazy, they just live on the benefits. And this way he turns people who live on social benefits into perpetrators, although they're vi really victims. So. People on benefits are the cause in their mind. So, please be a little more brief. Van der Dijk is a Dutch philosopher and he wanted to cut benefits, but this is fascist thinking with the aim of discriminating the lower classes and not, I wouldn't even mention Mr. Sarazin. So what I want to say is that racism divides society so please come to an end. Thank you. This was very, um, uh, very interesting. Next one, please. Well, I believe that racism is not only an instrument of the elite, and this can only lead to a lack of responsibility, you assume. Thank you. The next one, please. I would like to ask a question to Mark de Casitas. You say a society is either racist or it isn't. Could you please give an example for a non-racist society, please? Thank you. Could you please answer? Don't 
Do I have to? Are there non-racist societies? Well, I have to think about it. I think, I think the word racist can only be applied apart from the 18th century. I did not find a society or look for a society that was non-racist. Or that is non-racist. The question is whether whether you can choose to be non-racist. Well, that's right, but I do not see a society with optima uh, op optimal equal equalities. I mean, is, has there been a society without equality? Uh, well, maybe you did not get me right. Is the question, does the society have to society? the choice to to opt for non no racism of course you can opt for that i would like to to make clear that there's a different stereotypes stereotypes can be erected toward whatever for example people with brown boots it, it does not matter at all every possible feature can be used to establish stereotypes but the process of stereotyping is very human it's part of the uh, psyche of human beings but in the case of human in the case of racism is why are there are several characters that are used for stereotypes there is no reason to actually think about racism there is no reason why we should take several features in order to create stereotypes it's just something that is being reproduced within the society and I think people can try to eliminate those stereotypes by or limiting them I think it's always complicated to talk about racist societies the question I would ask is have I as an individual the, do I as an individual have the choice to not think in racist patterns and to not behave in racist ways and just don't act in racist ways so, because in the end every society is composed of human beings so I would like to limit this down a bit because so maybe a brief answer It, this is a good question, but the way I understood Mark de Cassides, it's it is not possible for me to not think in racist ways because I am always reproducing racist knowledge, even subconsciously. So maybe this is the racism of the good guys, or I got it wrong. Well, that would free me from responsibility. And of course, I do always reproduce racist knowledge. But I can try and reflect it, and I can make a personal effort to cope with this knowledge. I am it is not it is not immoral to have this knowledge, but you have a responsibility to deal with it. So, it, this is not about personal interactions, but it's also a political issue. Thank you. There are three more people who want to say something. My name is Tina from the Saxonian Refugee Council. I think migration background <laughs> is absolutely ridiculous because everybody has one or the other migration background. Why don't we just say people with background? I don't have a question but a wish for the workshops also. 
I would like if today talking about institutional racism that we try to still talk on an individual level, not talk about others, the, the, the other, like Mr. Sloterdijk, and they are the bad ones. And I know it's difficult, but it is a first step. I would like to see discussions that don't say other people do this, but um, please reflect your own racist thinking and talk about yourself. Maybe can I short comment on migration background? I, I don't like it. It's an ugly word. But I still advocate for using it for a certain while because this term shows a certain development because 10 years ago everybody said foreigners or non-nationals but today migration background also signals a certain degree of belonging here so this is a redefinition and on and secondly if I don't talk about migration background then I also can't discuss the discrimination if I say the Stuttgart administration is not representative for the 40 percent of people with migration background living in Stuttgart, then which other way is there to talk about these imbalances? So I need it like as a crutch to name these issues. So I hope that shortly before I die, this word will not be in use any longer. Miguel Trees. I, I'm skeptical about the idea that racism can only be seen from the perspective of all individuals or what you can do about it on your own. It's obvious that racism is a societal phenomenon. It's embedded in the culture, in everyday life. And you have to try to to fight it and you all talked about the structures and the institutions but it affects the whole of society you you, you can't exclude yourself from this system the, that is one of the traits of racism or machism, you treated it in an isolated way, but it is not an isolated phenomenon. It's not just one single way of excluding people. I think you're right. And what I said about being biased is a question of methods. How can I see racism, either I have certain norms or I'm biased. So this is about making the perspective of the affected more important. So like 10 years ago in Germany, we had conferences with people or none of the participants had a migration background. Or it even went so far that if somebody had a migration background, they were disqualified as being uh, subjective and not able to judge in an objective way. So I would like to promote this discussion saying that the, what everybody feels is important to, to define racism is a question of methodological access. Otherwise, you are correct, of course, in an analysis of society, one could also cover the topic, but I think you always have to be a certain biased position. And I think it's not about either or, it's always about out and. So society can't change if people can't change. But if people change, then society can change. 
so you can both work on an individual level or on society level and it doesn't exclude each other. So I see one more person. Is there anybody else who would like to contribute something to our discussion because we have 10 minutes left? Well, the question we have to answer is there were, we agree that racism is something we want to avoid and have to avoid, but how does racism uh, is how is racism created? Because it's a lack of empathy. You cannot um, put yourself in the shoes of your of the other person. You avoid the contact because you have fear. You are afraid of of something that is foreign and this is a psychological force and it may be the case that this also causes racism and disapproval it is something we have to fight but we have to ask the question and question what can we do in order to get rid of those racist thoughts even uh, and to start with children in order to avoid those uh, thoughts to develop the themselves. And we have to put ourselves into the shoes of the other. I have to say, I also have in situation when I or trying to talk to an Arab person that is looking a little bit grim and I might have Fears, and although I would like to recognize him and like to even hug him, and this is a psychological force and momentum that we have to deal with. We have to um, we have to try to understand the other. Why does he talk, speak another language? And, and if we can achieve that, that we can have done a lot. Thank you very much. I would like to ask for short statements. So, I, I would not recommend to just hug foreign people. I mean, unknown people, not foreign necessarily. Of course, it is important to talk about it. A lack of empathy, I agree with you, it exists. But it is like an organized lack of empathy. Because the divide between foreigners and nationals was very rigid, and the foreigners were seen as so different that he was not seen as a real subject. And this is also the case in uh, investigation procedures. There is a big difference between uh, in reports on natives and reports on foreigners because with native perpetrators always the motivation is described and this is not the case with foreign perpetrators this is just um, ignored because people uh, describe their crimes as senseless crime a lack of empathy is certainly right but there is an organizational um, point or thing that has is important and now we have about 60 years of history of immigration in Germany and people have to ask them why should you be afraid of the, the strange, the stranger and the thing is you do not know the th in fact now is we know too much not that there's a lack of knowledge because people have see so certain um, people with certain st appearances then they have pictures in their mind that this is the reason why they do not want to talk to them. This is too much knowledge and not a lack of knowledge or the fear. It is racism and the fight against racism is always a position in which people have to forget certain, certain things. It is not about learning new things, but it is also about forgetting things. I have seen a study that about 40% of the Dresden citizens think that there are too many foreigners and the ratio is about 7.5% uh, is rather low in German evidence and this is the point if 
so many people say that there are too many foreigners, then、um, this is a kind of knowledge that、um, prevents people from talking to others or foreigners. I'm Popura. You have mentioned a good point. There are racist societies and non-racist society. I think you're right, but of course there are very racist theses. You wrote a blog concerning that. What I wanted to say is, if you if you want to eliminate the reasons of racism, for example, apartheid. Then you can also eliminate the, a racist society or the racism within a society. And、uh, I would like to mention that the reasons lead to racism, and we have to get rid of the reason, the causes. And the question is, how can we do this? In South Africa, it was.、Uh, Successful with the apartheid here in Germany, it will be a very difficult and long-term process. Thank you very much. You wanted to make a comment. My name is Andrea Eifert. I would would like to thank you for your speech. I think we sh I agree that we need certain certain terms. I myself have a migration background. I was. Socialized here, and I think this term is rather good because it illustrates the process of, of that are included there. It, it might be a little bit philosophical, but I would like to give an example. For example, the black sheep. The black sheep would not be a metaphor if you would not see the white flock. If you wouldn't know the sheep or wouldn't know any sheep, the Black sheep would just be a sheep and nothing else. But I think that we need certain terms and words to include aspects that might not be as nice. But we need to these terms, precise terms, and in turn we have to、um, get rid and, and open up, destroy other words that are not as apt. We need precise terms. And we, at the same time, we need to open up and break、uh, other terms that might not be as apt. I would like to include another aspect into the debate, maybe the question whether there are di、um, differences according to the gender,、um, for example, concerning those people that become victims of racism. Are there differences today, or well, of course there are differences in terms of how stereotypes st stereotypes concerning women and men are created or are established. For example, a gay、uh, producer from with Turkish backgrounds has once said that if he says he's Turkish. People say, "Okay, nice." And if you say,、uh, "Oh no," and people say, "If he is gay," people say, "Oh well, that's good." So the people there can be a rather fine differentiation depending on your point of view. I did not pursue all of the studies or try to follow it. There is a lack of studies how. What are differences between men and women, or concerning、uh, their racial or racial actions?、Uh, I cannot answer to that. I have to say,、uh, I would like to answer to that. Last weekend, I had a workshop, and I saw a rap video that.、Um, Rapped against Arianism because he felt affected and he made very racist、um, comments. And the women in the workshop said, "Whoa, that is very harsh."、Um, but his experiences that I, that I remember when I see 
this video, but uh, but is it possible to forget about my experience? It, the the uh, an important point is whether you really can get can forget about it and neutrally. Whether you can be neutral and listen to the concerns of the other, and then only afterwards uh, criticize the topic, and this is a big. Um, part of the rap things, of the rap videos and rap songs that are done. And what sometimes is being associated with any endeavors, like in person, there is often concern to that. I can um, take my time to think, uh, to look at both points, uh, both perspectives. However, this video was very. Um, difficult to analyze. I am Obert Jan. I am a director. And I didn't really want to say something, but then you started talking about Arabs, and I would like to comment on this. There's always this danger of talking about good and bad foreigners. I myself have a good foreigner as a partner. She is Italian and we have a child together. So what's the problem, what's the difference for you facing an Arab or a Norwegian because you don't know their mother language in either case and would you be afraid with a Norwegian? So in in Germany, we, we also we, we think Italians are nice, they have the nice restaurants, but on the other hand, they are controlled by the mafia. So um, I just want to say this is dangerous. Keep it in your mind to make this distinction between the good and the bad or the dangerous for us. And, and another thing, we have a lot of protest at the moment about asylum homes and the building of mosques, but fortunately we also have counter demonstrations and, and there's always these pictures in the news that we defend the foreigners or the asylum seekers, but if I'm honest, I'm not really interested in them. I don't care what they think about me, because it happens that asylum seekers see uh, people clad in black in front of their homes and, and, and these were left people clad in black but the people in the home thought they might be right extremists, skinheads so we should better ask those people what they think about what we're doing and if they are okay with it thank you very much so I see a last comment and then and then we'll have a short information on workshops with Sh Sh Stefan and Micha. Mr. Tekesides, I in my opinion racism has always been existent through all of history. At the end of the day, Middle Europe as one big landscape that many passed. And I think even in the Middle Ages we had racism because already back then the Jews were made responsible for all kinds of problems. And then we had colonization and this haunts us to this day and not only us Germans but all other colonizing powers and we call colonialism an evil but there is all sorts of discrimination handicapped people are discriminated so I don't talk about integration anymore. I want inclusion. I want to break down the barriers in people's heads. And I would like to meet on a new level, on an equal playing field, because we're all humans and we're all equal.
and everybody has their skills, their knowledge, and can choose how to use skills and knowledge. So this is why I give workshops for handicapped, um, and because I want to show that even though I'm handicapped, I I can do this because I I may be handicapped, but I can still think. And everybody, even with a high degree of handicaps, still has skills. So inclusion is what we need. But in the last government and even in the current government, I feel that inclusion is not a topic anymore. So, and I'm sad about this because when we've stopped developing and making progress in this area. So principally I think you're right, but I have a little problem with this concept of inclusion because it implies that you have been in excluded before, but you have never completely been excluded. You have always been included to a certain degree. So, so I made up this concept of interculturalism, but this concept has its problems too, this term. But I think that an anti-racist perspective mustn't always be included in the concept of anti-racism. The perspective of inclusion it includes a positive vision that also includes anti-racism, and I would support this because it's a positive vision. But as far as chances for inclusion are concerned, I have a different opinion because if you read the new coalition's contract, you can see that it is included and in the chapter on immigration, the integration is not so much used. Words like diversity and intercultural openness are used so we see a different direction here and in the area of education the term of inclusion is prescribed but the problem is we still have special schools and and the conventional schools are asked to put inclusion into practice, but they don't get extra financial funding. For instance, my son is in a class with five children with all sorts of degrees of intellectual incapacities or disabilities and, and learning dysfunctions. And this is different from the situation it was when I grew up. It may not be ideal, but I see some progress. I, I am optimistic. So I think we should follow up this track, and I see a realistic chance to even make further progress. Thank you very much to Manuela Ritz, to Mark Dagesides, and to you as the audience. And I would then pass on to Stefan and Michel. We have some organizational um, information because workshop five is a new workshop. It's going about to be about black German literature, history. Not by Natasha Kelly and Mr. Müller-Adebisi. And in the second part, we will also include the museum, so participants can visit the exhibition. So please consider if you want to participate in Workshop 5, because all other workshops are very full already. So in order to be able to see the distribution of participants on workshops, could you please raise your hands so that we can see who participates in which workshop. 
and then you can still decide if you want to participate in a really full workshop. So workshop one, closed event today. Who would like to participate in this? No. No. There used to be more people. Workshop two, racism in town, Mügeln. Workshop three, occupied jobs, racism in education and training. Workshop four, racial profiling. That looks more evenly distributed than it looked before. Workshop five, we still have spare places. Okay. So you then have 10 minutes of break and it'd be nice if everybody would be back by 12.45.